This morning's scripture reading comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. We have a great opportunity in the midst of a bad situation. We wish that we could be together with brethren from all over this side of the country for the lectureship this week, and we cannot do that with good reason. We have, though, on YouTube and on Facebook these capabilities that are often used for evil. Just like television, anything is neutral, but it is often used for evil, can be used for good. These things are often used for evil, can be used for good in a lot of different ways beside our lectureship, but we have a special opportunity this week. Those without Facebook can go to YouTube and see these lectures directly. There's a playlist, there are videos on our West Virginia School of Preaching website, on our West Virginia School of Preaching channel. On Facebook, on our West Virginia School of Preaching page, there will be every morning a post that comes up at 6 in the morning, not because I'm up then, but because I scheduled it to come up then. It'll come up at 6 in the morning that has that day's schedule, lectures, speakers, and the links where you can click directly on them. There's a share button there that you could use to share with your friends and family and hope that they would share further. We've already gotten a lot of publicity that I think the school might not have gotten otherwise because of this circumstance and we have the opportunity to magnify it this week. I don't know how to do this, but I'll, I'm also told there's the opportunity to have something called a watch party, not a gathering where you talk about your time pieces, but something where you gather people together online and watch something together and invite people that way. I figure if I want to learn how to do that this week, I'll find a 10-year-old and ask him or her. But if, I, if you know how to do that, you might be able to do that and enhance the appeal of the lectureship. I appreciate Michelle working so hard on editing these things together and our speakers that did their lectures early outside of the norm. So, I'm, yeah, I'm a little depressed that we can't have our lectureship in person, but it's a great opportunity, and I hope that we can all press to the finish of it and make it the best that it can possibly be, if you so desire. This is not, of course, a demand. It's, it's a request. We have opportunity to be saved, and that statement ought never be taken lightly. There's a lot of news in the world that is suppressed there's a lot of news in the world that is just overlooked. It occurs to me that sometimes the stories that need the front page don't even get the back page. The, stores, the, the stories that need the, the, uh, the attention, the headlines, the banners on the news stations aren't even noticed. There's one story that's historical that will tell you that if there's anything that needs to be on the front lines every day. If there's anything that needs to be on the headlines every day. If there's anything that needs to be on the banners every day. This ought to be it. And I don't say it by way of rhetoric. I don't say it because I'm a preacher. I don't say it because this is a church gathering. I say it because I deeply mean it from the bottom of my heart. And that story, of course, is that God planned for Jesus Christ to come into the world to save our sins. That's the story of history. All history focuses around it. Every day ought to be about it to everybody. But this same Bible that tells us about that story in its terms, in God's terms, tells us that very few people will pay attention to it. Very few people will find the way of salvation. But that doesn't make it any less important. That doesn't make it any less true. In fact, that lends to the credibility of it. When most people are believing something, I question it. Now, 
a lot of times there might be people that believe, a lot of people that believe things and those things are true. A lot of people believe the world is round. That's true. A lot of people believe the sun is 93 million miles away. I believe that too. But sometimes when there are a lot of people that believe something, I don't believe it. I question it. I want to know because of that statement in Matthew 7 verses 13 and 14 that tells us very few people are going to find the way to eternal life. Eternal life is what God wants us to have. This plan of salvation might be more than we ever think of it to mean. I'm going to talk in terms that I've been mentioning recently. Maybe I learned a couple new words or a couple new prefixes. There's the, ma there's the macro plan of salvation. And that is the large thing that took place throughout history to allow us to have a home in heaven with God after we get done with this sinful earth, after we overcome the things that we've done wrong, and after we try to help people along the way. There's the macro plan of salvation that is described in several verses of Scripture, in the whole Bible really, but a few verses sum it up probably in a more succinct way than others. One of those was read for us by Joshua so well just a few minutes ago. From 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 18 and 19. Verse 17 says that if there is anyone in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. And then verses 18 and 19. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through his son Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. What's that mean? He explains in the next verse. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. God the creator was in the person Jesus of Nazareth who became Christ reconciling the world to himself. How? By not imputing their trespasses to them. There are people that might mock the symbolism that God has given to us, but I dare not do that. We dare not do that. God taught us throughout history the symbolism of substitution, that animal blood in that old covenant could be offered for the blood of people who deserve to die for their sins, that people could substitute an animal for their own lives, and then Christ came as the Passover Lamb of God. All of history points to the person of Jesus Christ walking this earth about 2,000 years ago. The creation, he was there for it. The flood, God called down the flood upon the wickedness of mankind but allowed Noah and his family to be saved. One of his sons was Shem who would bring about the Semitic people, one of his which would be the Jews through Abraham and Abraham's nation would bring about the person of the Christ. It all focused on Jesus getting here to save people. All of the prophecies of the Old Testament focused on Jesus getting here to save people. All of the history focused on Jesus getting here to save people. There were other things going on in the world during the time of the Tower of Babel. But God, maybe, and during the times, during any particular time that you might find there, but God focused on the things that would get us to Christ. Maybe not the Tower of Babel, because all people were trying to gather together to build a tower to the heavens, and God said, what I want you to do is disperse. But then you pick any other point in history, and in the book of Esther, in the book of Ezra, and Nehemiah, and all these points of history are telling us what happened to get Christ to the earth so that all nations could be blessed by him. We just have a snapshot of what happened in Israel and the nations surrounding it because that's from what place the Christ would come. That's the macro plan of salvation. That Christ came showing the grace of God dying on the cross for the sins of every human being. If that's boggling to your mind, congratulations, it ought to be. It ought to be boggling to everybody's mind so that we stand in awe of the love and graciousness of a just and righteous God and at least figuratively fall on our faces before him to give him adoration. That's what we've been studying. The characteristics of God and how those characteristics flow into the church that he purchased with his blood and how that church ought to behave. Now this morning, let's focus on what we'll call the micro plan of salvation. The macro plan of salvation is all of that. 
But the micro plan of salvation comes down to each and every individual that ever is on the planet. Who comes to an age that he or she does something that is wrong, knows that it is wrong, has the consciousness of guilt, and knows that there needs to be something done about it. Those individuals have the opportunity to look to Muhammad. They have the opportunity to look to Buddha. They have the opportunity to look to atheism and deny all religious things. And we hope and pray that they have the opportunity to look to Jesus Christ because he's the real, the one, the only answer. And yet somebody told me the other day of a statistic that just blew my mind that 29% of the people on the face of the planet today will die without ever hearing the name of Jesus. That's the greatest tragedy in the world. Because people will be lost without Jesus. It is not the absence of the gospel that causes people to be lost. It's people's sin that causes them to be lost. And that emphasizes the need to get the gospel to the lost because it's the gospel that will save when it is heard and when it is believed and when it is obeyed. And that comes down to the micro plan of salvation. Those of you who worship in churches of Christ have heard this plan of salvation at the end of many a lesson, probably almost every lesson you've ever heard. Sometimes because of time, I gloss over it a little too quickly. I want to take time this morning to focus on it a little more. Each point would deserve its own lesson. Each point would deserve its own series of lessons. But let's put something in compact nature that we can send to our neighbors and friends, maybe via social media, maybe some other way, to remind us of the micro plan of salvation. That is what it means to me. Paul alludes to it in the next verses in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He says in verse 20 and 21, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We implore you. Paul says, we are ambassadors for God, he said of the apostles. We're not like the apostles, but we still have the commission to preach the gospel. And we still have the commission to beg people to put on Christ in baptism and be saved. Because then, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's the macro plan of salvation again. And then he gets back to the micro in chapter 6 verse 1. We then, as workers together with him, plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. How could you receive the grace of God in vain? Well, you know all that happened. Someone's taken the time to tell you all that happened. Maybe people in a four times gave their lives to bring you all that happened. And you ignore it. And then God's grace toward you, God's macro plan of salvation toward you, was all in vain. It's as if you looked God in the eye and said, I don't care. It's as if we spit in God's face, as horrible as that is to imagine. That's what it is when we take the sacrifice of his son and say, we don't want anything to do with it. Oh, we'll listen politely, but we don't want anything to do with it. The early restoration movement preachers trying to restore the New Testament church came up with a little system of teaching the plan of salvation that was never meant to be all-inclusive, but topical points that would underneath include what we need to do to be saved. And they told the little kids in their neighborhoods when they were inviting them to invite their parents to gospel meetings, go and tell your parents this exercise. Hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. I say that those restoration preachers started that, and they did in that particular setting, but it wasn't something that they made up out of thin air. Those points are found in the Bible. You won't find a list on any page of your Bible written by God that has those particulars, one, two, three, or bulleted points. But you'll do better than that. You'll find them in stories, in the book of Acts. You'll find them in history, in the epistles. You'll find them in command, in the gospels and the epistles. And when you put them all together with a thorough study of the New Testament and not just a pick a verse here and a pick a verse there sort of study, then you'll find those five things. Give attention to them. First, number one, hearing the gospel. 
You got to hear it to believe it. That just makes sense. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Paul said in Romans chapter 10 verse 13. He's coming toward the middle of a discussion about how he desperately wants Jewish people who did not accept the Christ as the Messiah to hear and accept the Messiah. He's not saying a verbal assent is all that you need to do. He's saying get started with it. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But then he asks a question. How then shall they call on him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace. The gospel needs a transmitter as well as the receiver. And those of us who are Christians and not transmitting the gospel, not giving our means to transmit the gospel, not doing something to transmit the gospel, need to repent and start doing something to transmit the gospel. Because, he says in the conclusion of that little section, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. This 29% of the world that never heard the name of Jesus didn't have a chance to have faith because they didn't hear the word of God. Upon hearing it, a person must believe it. It's a wild story to believe in some regards. It's not what you see on the news every day. It's not the kind of thing that's happened for the last 1900 years. You haven't seen miracles for the last 1900 years. You haven't seen people raised from the dead for the last 1950 years or so. You haven't seen people walking on water. You haven't seen people claiming to be a Messiah with a new message that did those sorts of things. That's what makes it unique. If these things happened every day, everybody would be unique. But this person is unique who did these miracles and then who inspired 12 men to do these miracles and to pass on that ability to a few others but planned that it would die off before the first century came to an end and when the word of God was complete. You don't see these kinds of things happening every day and yet I'm out there asking people to believe that there was a Jesus of Nazareth who was born without an earthly father, born of a virgin mother, who grew to the age of 30 and did some amazing things like feeding 5,000 people with, with uh, two lo five loaves of bread and two fish, 5,000 men plus the women and children, like walking on the water out to the boat where the disciples were, like raising Jairus' daughter from the dead, like stopping the funeral procession of the widow of Nain when her, uh, when her son was being carried in a casket because he was going to raise the boy from the dead. Like casting demons out of people that were allowed for a short time to show that Christ had the power over, the, over them and so did his apostles. That stuff's hard to believe just because we haven't seen it yet but oh the testimony of history is so full. If historians would apply the same tests of eyewitnesses to the kinds of things that are written in the Bible, then the Gospels would be recorded as some of the most historically reliable things that were ever written. And the resurrection of Christ would be, is, and really ought to be recognized as the most historically accurately recorded event of history. Really happened. There are lots of eyewitnesses. I never saw George Washington... I believe firmly he existed, that he was president of the United States. A lot of other things about history that come down to us about George Washington. Some good, some that people would judge to be bad. I believe he existed. I believe those things happened. Never met him. Never saw him. Never saw a video of him. But the unanimous testimony of history is that he existed and that he was the first President of the United States. You have people biased in favor of him who wrote, people biased not in favor of him who wrote. And you can glean the truth. Jesus Christ, the record claims, was killed on a cross, buried where people could see that he was buried. Three days later, nobody saw him raised from the dead, but for 40 days after that, there was not one person with an hallucination, there was not one or two people with, with some sort of wild story. There were not a few people with uh, a plot to deceive. There were over 500 eyewitnesses who saw his resurrected body and challenged people during the time that the Gospels were being written that those things really happened. And then people went to their deaths claiming it. If I had been there with George Washington and his army, and 20 years later, after his death, somebody came to me and put a gun to my head and said, admit that you were with George Washington and that he really existed 
And if you admit that he really existed, I'll shoot you in the head. I don't know what I'd do because truth matters to me, but I don't know that I have any allegiance to George Washington. I don't know that I'd be condemned eternally if I said, no, I'm not really sure about that. But these people who saw Jesus Christ met the swords and the spears, the beheadings and the piercings. When they were forced to deny, they saw a resurrected man. And they went to their deaths anyway. Now to him who believes this story, he has the hope of everlasting life. John 3 verse 16. And to the person who does not believe this story, he'll die in his sins. John chapter 8 and verse 24. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. We never ask people to believe based on blind faith. We ask people to believe based on the suppressed faith mocked, ridiculed, nevertheless sound evidence of history. Jesus of Nazareth resurrected from the dead. And if a person believes that, he ought to be willing to do number three or number four, however you order it, and that is to confess that belief. Our Lord made it very plain that he would not stand for people who would secretly believe, he would not stand for secret disciples. He told the apostles when they were going out on a limited commission, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. Whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. So he won't stand for secret disciples who shuttle off to church every now and then, but don't say anything about him during the week, don't stand up for his principles, allow people to mock him and ridicule him without saying a word on his behalf. He won't stand for that. We have examples in Acts chapter 8 and Romans chapter 10 of the need to confess him before we're baptized into Christ. The Ethiopian eunuch was taught the, about the Lord and somehow on his own came up with the idea that he should be baptized for the remission of his sins. He said, here is water, what hinders me from being baptized? And Philip the preacher said to him in Acts chapter 8 verse 37, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They both went down into the water and he baptized him at that point. Some people question the validity of that scripture, but you can't question the validity of confession before baptism because it's there in Romans chapter 10. What does the word of faith say? The word is near you in your mouth and your heart, verse 8, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You see, the confession and the belief come before salvation. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So a person who doesn't believe in Christ need not be baptized. Won't do him any good if he would be. But the person who sees Jesus Christ in his mind's eye of faith, knows that he existed, knows that he's the Son of God, needs to be willing to confess that before men before he's baptized into Christ. And that's not all he needs to do before he's baptized into Christ. Another one of those fingers is to repent. Hear, believe, confess, repent. To repent is to change and to change completely. That is to change from a sinful lifestyle completely. There may be people like Cornelius who was living a pretty good life but still was not saved. He needed to repent of not being baptized into Christ. There may be people who are filthy urchins on this earth, evil people, and they can repent of those evils, turn around from them. God commanded that to people. We cannot continue in the kinds of lifestyles that go against what Paul, Jesus, the apostles taught in Scripture and still expect to receive the grace of God. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall, any, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Romans chapter 6 verses 1 and 2. We need to repent, Jesus said. There were times of ignorance that God overlooked, Paul said on Athen, in Athens, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Do you know that some of the first words out of Jesus' mouth in his ministry, maybe the first words were, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. A lot of people go to churches to hear a soft message of encouragement, 
and go to hear a soft message. And it is right to encourage those brethren who are being faithful. We need messages of encouragement. We need not trample on faithful brethren all the time. But what the world out there needs to hear more than anything is this one word. Repent. Stop it. Stop the drinking and stop the drug trafficking and stop the drug abusing. Stop, stop the sex trafficking and stop the sex outside of marriage between a man and a woman lawfully married. And stop the hatred and stop the looting and stop the violence and stop the killing of the unborn babies and stop, the, stop all the immorality that you see around. Stop it. That's repentance. And it's what this world needs. And it's what people need in order to be saved. We need to stop the things that we're doing wrong. We know it. We need to change. And then a person needs to be baptized for the remission of sins. Peter said it to the crowd who'd crucified Jesus. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent, he said. That means to change. That doesn't mean to be sorry. Godly sorrow leads to repentance, 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10. Stop the sin. Be sorry about it, but let that stop you from sinning. Change. There are so many more and more activities of mankind that God regards as behavior that human science comes along and says are genetic inevitabilities God still says their sin, that means it's possible to repent. That means it's possible to change. It doesn't mean it won't be a struggle. It doesn't mean God expects there to never be a stumble the rest of your existence, but he means for you to intend to never have a stumble the rest of your existence. He means for you to mean it. Those people were sorry on the day of Pentecost. A little bit later, Peter said to a crowd in Solomon's porch in Acts chapter 3 verse 19, Repent and be converted so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Those people on the day of Pentecost were baptized for the remission of their sins. 3,000 of them were that day. We know that that word means to immerse from the Greek language, but even in English you know it from Romans chapter 6. We are buried with him in baptism, just as we, and just like that we're going to be raised with him to walk in newness of life, that passage says. The old man of sin is crucified. We're raised to walk in newness of life with him. Therefore, the passage goes on in Romans 6 to say that we ought not let sin reign in our mortal bodies but we put it away and yield the members of our body as instruments of righteousness alive from the dead the world corrupts baptism in several ways the world has corrupted baptism into a mere sprinkling of water on someone and that never has worked it was always designed to be that baptism that reenacts the death burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ the world has corrupted baptism into some sort of pouring water on people. And I suppose, if I understand my history correctly, that those came out of decent motives because there might be sick people lying on beds and they might want to make a deathbed confession. How are you going to pick them up and baptize them in a pool of water? And so they sprinkled or they poured. But when they did, they violated the law of God. It's possible. Where there's a will, there's a way. I've seen it done. And then people corrupt baptism simply by putting it in the wrong place. So many denominations under the name of Christ out there tell you that you're saved the moment you say a sinner's prayer. Remember we're trying to restore the New Testament church. Get back beyond creeds. Get back beyond anything that man has written and bound on people. That sinner's prayer is nowhere in the Bible. You can't find a person that said it. But people will still tell you you're saved when you say that sinner's prayer and you can be baptized later if you want to. Or you can be saved at this altar and you can be baptized later if you want to. So some people have been immersed but with the false understanding that their sins were already forgiven. May I suggest to you that those people give serious consideration to being baptized for the right reasons. You can't understand it wrong and do it right. They need to be baptized understanding their sins were not washed away and they won't be washed away until they are baptized for the remission of sins. Paul was told to rise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on the name of the Lord. 
And the plan of salvation then is not limited to one hand with five fingers. But you do have that easily memorable mnemonic device to hear the gospel, believe it, repent, confess, and be baptized for the remission of sins. But finger number six entails a whole lot that you spend the rest of your lifetime studying. And that's to be faithful until death to receive a crown of life. Revelation 2 verse 10. To be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58. And that means attendance at church services when possible. And that means faithfulness to the Lord when out amongst people at work. And that means shying away from the activities of the world and rebelling against the forced activities of immorality sometimes. And it means standing for the Lord. And it means speaking up for the Lord. And it means forgiving other people because if we don't do that we can't be forgiven. Matthew 6 verses 14 and 15. And it means a whole plethora of things encapsulated under the heading that we ought to be growing in Christ and in knowledge of him. 2 Peter 3.18, Ephesians 4.15 and 16. And if you want to call that micro, that's the micro plan of salvation. There's the macro that God did all of this through history. And then there's the micro. Will you listen to it? Will I listen to it? In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul goes on. We then, as workers together with him, plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, here's what God says, and he quotes an Old Testament passage, Isaiah 49 verse 8. In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. God's willing to help. It's too tough to put off my old sins. It's too tough to change. It's too tough to tell my family I'm doing this. It's too tough to be baptized for the right reasons. It, God says, no, no, no. In an acceptable time, I've heard you. And in the day of salvation, I, the all-powerful, all-loving, all-knowing God of truth, love, mercy, justice, righteousness, is there for you in the day that you decide I'm going to follow him because there's no other way beyond the grave and there's nothing else beyond the grave but heaven or hell and I want to go to heaven. He's there to help you. So then he, he bounces out of that Old Testament passage in 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2 by saying, Behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. You don't have anything else. For 55 years I've woken up and the sun's come up every morning. But there's no guarantee it will tomorrow. Could be a trumpet with the sound of a shout of the archangel and the Lord descending to gather those who are his in the air. Could be that. Could be that before the morning. I can't do anything about yesterday. I don't get a redo button. I don't have an undo button. I can't start a new game and reset my lives can't do anything about the future to assure that it's there for me to repent. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. If we could help you, would you please come forward as we stand and sing.